My dad played on the weekends. He was the typical weekend warrior, and he went out and played a public golf course called Haynes Point out in D.C. And um, I went with him one day to caddy just just to kind of be with him for the day. He took me with him, and I was carrying a bag and you know helping with the clubs. And really, the first time I was exposed to golf, and uh, I thought it was pretty cool. So I decided to uh, take the game up at that point and try it, and I just fell in love with it. And and uh, it really created when I look back a great childhood I had um, I, the the learning the developmental stage of, of learning the game of golf was just just came naturally because it's what I did and my friends did growing up well, the neatest thing with my parents was they never pushed me in anything they they kind of led uh, indirectly by example because they always worked really hard um, my mom was an interior decorator and and made custom-made drapes in the basement, and that was a lot of hard work, hand stitching, hand sewing. My dad uh, worked for the Washington uh, Gas Company, and then he then he worked for the uh, Department of Transportation in the government. Came home uh, after we ate dinner, they were down in the basement doing the drapes, and and then they spent weekends uh, when he when he had to to put up the jobs, and when he had a chance, he'd go out and play golf. My mom didn't play golf at that time at all, and. Uh, I, I, I just remember my parents always working really hard. I remember my brother uh, always was holding down two or three jobs and trying to go to school at the same time. So the work ethic in our environment was, was always there. And uh, it, none of us were really scared of working, that's for sure. And, and uh, I enjoyed it. I had a paper route uh, from the time I was 10 years old. And then um, I worked at the golf course. And then when I got old enough to drive the newspaper truck, I drove the newspaper truck. Instead of dropping to the houses, I dropped the papers to the carriers. And uh, that was, I was making uh, six, seven, eight thousand a year for the six years I did that from uh, junior year in high school through, or well, senior year in high school through college. I did that uh, newspaper route where I went to work on at one in the morning on the weekends and got off at 10. And uh, then I'd go over and mow the greens at the golf course. You know, I look back and I wouldn't trade my childhood for anything. It was. It was what I would wish every kid would have an opportunity to go through. I wish my kid, uh, both my kids, all three of my kids could go through what I went through as a child um, growing up, working like we did to have the opportunity to work in a, 
a learning environment and a real positive environment that we had. It was, it was a ball. I had so much fun growing up. It was, it was fantastic. I was always small. Uh, I was not the fastest guy. Uh, I was a good athlete and everything, but I was not the exceptional athlete on the field. I played football, baseball, basketball. Uh, I boxed for, and I, I love the boxing. I think that really helped me a lot when I was eight years old to I was 16. Um, I enjoyed that, that part of my life, but I, always looking back knowing that I wish I believed in myself then as much as I do now because um, there's a big difference. So that was the difference from um, being that guy that was, I, I think I had the athletic ability, even though I was small in stature, of a lot of the guys that I played against, but I wouldn't believe myself that I was as good as those guys. And golf allowed me to um, improve at my own level. I didn't have formal teaching. I, I learned from uh, you know watching the guys my dad play with, and then I had a few kids uh, that were friends of mine that took up the game uh, because we grew up next to the University of Maryland golf course. And we were exposed and had opportunity to work and, and play the game at the, at the facility we grew up at, basically. So it, it made it fun. We worked at the driving range, we did carts, we worked maintenance, we just did all the outside operations of the golf facility and it allowed us access to, to learn the game of golf. You just spent every summer day, waking moment, is practicing and playing golf. And, uh, that's just what we did. If we weren't working, we were on the golf course. So we were on the golf course all the time except for sleeping. I don't think there are very many people that are natural golfers. I mean, it's not a, a normal athletic move. It's a created, it's an initiated move from a static position, which creates a lot of tension, a lot of anxiety. So it doesn't come natural to a lot of people where uh, other sports that are, where you're an athletic person, you're reacting to a ball coming to you or you're throwing to a target. Um, it, it's just an instinctive thing. Golf's really not instinctive. So I don't, for me, definitely it was not a, a natural uh, motion to, to learn. And I really don't think anyone has really picked up a golf club and said, wow, this is pretty easy. Uh, it's it's a, an acquired, um, talent that you have to really work at. You can see it now in the modern game because a lot of guys, a lot of the young kids are uh, more robotic. They're, they're more of the same. They're, they all swing similar to each other. They're similar body types. But when you look back at the old days of, of really the legends that, that started the game of the Bobby Jones and the Sam Sneeds and the Arnold Palmers and the Gary Players and the Chi Chi's, Lee Trevino, Jack Nicklaus, they had such unique golf swings. Raymond Floyd, you throw all the greats, not one of them swung the club even close to like the other guy. So they learned the game, where really I call it digging it out of the dirt. They went to the range, they figured out what worked for them. Nobody told them how to swing a golf club. Um, probably the most modern guy, or the modern guy now with a swing that is really to, to his own is a Jim Furyk. Uh, a very unique swing, he, he learned what works for him learned it at an early age, decided he and his dad, who was his teacher, decided not to change the swing because it probably wouldn't, he would never be the player he is now if he tried to be somebody else and not Jim Furyk. So uh, the game doesn't come naturally. You know, to, to use all those examples, it's just proof that, that the game in, in the early stages and back when I was learning the game was just dig it out of the dirt and figure out what, what works for you. Jack was truly the idol that I grew up with. Um, he just, he was the guy that took over for Arnie. He's the one that uh, dethroned him, I guess, because Arnie was the man, and, put, and Arnie was really a little before my time to where I could remember. Uh, but Jack was so dominant through the late 60s and 70s, and, and that's when I remember golf as, a, as I guess, the imprint it put, had on me um, early on. And I just remember seeing Jack, it just seemed like they, they always televised the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th holes, maybe the 14th, and when Jack, he, he never missed putts. He, every time the camera was on him, he, and he was in the lead, he made putts and everybody else collapsed. And uh, 
It's just, he was the man. Nobody could beat Jack. As a kid, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And then when I went to college, I decided I wanted to be a forest ranger. And I couldn't get through the sciences. I didn't realize there was so much sciences involved in, in being a forest ranger. So uh, then I decided I wanted to be a cop. And uh, so I graduated in law enforcement. And uh, I decided after I graduated that I was going to at least give golf a, a try first. So I went down and I played the mini tours, in, uh, or the, the mini tour, which was down in Daytona and Orlando. Um, called the Space Coast Mini Tour, and I went broke in all of 81. Took my, my savings, some of my parents' savings, and, and basically went belly up. Came back, was working manpower for a month or two, cleaning out a burned out warehouse and painting a truck transportation depot. And uh, my coach got promoted to uh, assistant AD, and uh, he offered me the coaching job, and I just jumped on it. I says, I don't care, you don't have to even pay me, just get me out of this warehouse. What happened during that time was my game developed. Uh, I worked, I continued to work really hard. I worked harder than any kid I ever recruited. Uh, they wanted to beat me, I wanted to beat them. So I kept my drive up. Uh, I was allowed to play in the section events. I qualified for a few um, uh, PGAs and US Opens. Had limited success in those. But I remember playing the PGA Championship down at, uh, I think it was 1987 or six at PGA National. And I was leading after 22 holes. And uh, I was on the board tied with Ray Floyd. And I see Floyd and I see Funk and I go, man, that just doesn't look right. You know, I was just so uncomfortable. And uh, I proceeded because of my, just get so uncomfortable with being in the lead and all of a sudden the focus is on me. You know, I proceeded to keep driving the ball in the rough and I fell back. I ended up making the cut and finished like 46th in the tournament. but. It was a neat experience. I was on the board with, you know, there was Larry Nelson, Lanny Watkins, Nicholas, Floyd, Funk. I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't look right. I tried Q school. I didn't make it because I blew out my shoulder at the end of, uh, uh, in a pro-am at the end of August uh, that year before Q school. And that really shelved me for a couple years. And then, um, then I said, okay, I'm good enough to go to Q school again. I'll, I'll try it, even though I really wasn't ready. My shoulder was still pretty bad, and, and I made it. And I, I'm like, oh, shoot, now what do I do? You know, it was 1988. It was, uh, I qualified for the 89 season, and uh, I went out there really awestruck. I was like, oh, boy, oh, my shoulder's not good. I never played at this level. Uh, didn't know how to travel. Didn't know how to do anything on the road as far as uh, the expectations of you when you get to the PGA Tour. And uh, it was a total learning experience. I was overwhelmed and I lost my card. I think I won 59,000 that year and, and it took, took like 90, I think, to keep your card at that time. And I went back to Q school determined. It made me more determined because I felt like all it proved to me was that I was good enough to get through Q school and I wasn't good enough to be on the PGA Tour. And I, it set a new goal for me to see if I was ever good enough to be on the PGA Tour and keep my card once. I think I was just driven to see how good I could get. And I kept improving. I started beating people. Uh, I started getting used to shooting low numbers. You know, it's a, it's a process, you, you, you learn, but it, it's a long, very, very seldom does a guy come along like a Nicholas and a Tiger, especially a Tiger that's just so used to being up there at the top. It's funny because I've exceeded a lot of expectations I would even I wouldn't even put these on myself I wouldn't expect me to to win eight times at this time or win the players championship or have the success that I've had yet I can say that in one sentence and feel like well I can do a heck of a lot more I still feel like as long as I'm healthy and, and driven age is really not a factor Kirk Triplett on our tour one day, we were on a range, and he says, you know, something's got to be really screwed up with you to excel at this game. And, and we're all thinking, says, you know, that's kind of a backhanded truism there, because uh, there's something that we torture ourselves. The game tortures you with frustration, and, and uh, it, it breaks you down, but the highs are so good, and you feel so good when you, 
when you play well and all the work pays off and and then when you even look at the uh, you know w really when you look down at the the deepest part of it when you're not playing well it, what you learn coming out of that is uh, makes it all worthwhile why does this guy make it and why does this guy that seems to have even more talent doesn't make it or that guy with so much talent doesn't do as well as he should do versus another guy and you can't put your finger on it because there is that that ingredient that's inside a person that allows a guy to, to rise to a level that people don't believe. I mean, I, I remember when I did qualify for the tour, it was uh, me and a guy named Webb Heinzelman, and, and Webb and I were just beating up on each other in every section event, and, and he was fundamentally a better player, had a better background than me growing up. Uh, he he was very special player and a, and a really good guy, but uh, he just I ended up making. I was the one that, that moved on and, and uh, ended up having a career that that baffles me. Even. But uh, golly, to to say what it is, it's that it's that thing that's out there, that intangible ingredient that allows you to do it. Apparently, I have it. Um, I didn't mind. There's a big difference trying to make a putt for your living than going out here and just making it for twenty dollars. Uh, some people just can't get over actually having to play the game of golf for a living. It's, it's tough. Hey, Sharon, Taylor, Perry, how you doing? And the Pappas's, how you doing guys? I've always been the, the social guy out there and, and I love to have fun. I love to watch uh, when I get paired with the with the greats of the game growing up, I, I remember I loved just being paired with those guys to watch them. And I wasn't the guy that would put the blinders on and, and not want to watch these great shots. I love to this day being paired with Tiger and because he can do with a golf ball what nobody else can do. He, he's amazing, he's fearless. And I love watching that. I love complimenting a guy when he's playing well. When, I, when he's out there, I'm, I'm, on his, I'm on his bandwagon during the round as, and during the tournament. We could be fighting for the same trophy and I'm in contention, but I, I want to beat them because I'm playing good too. And uh, so the killer instinct is not, you know, I, I won't wish ill on a guy. Um, I still want to beat him. Um, so I guess that's the killer instinct. You still want to beat him, but I want to beat him the right way. And, and I want him to just hand it to me. If they want to hand it to me, that's great. But uh, I really enjoy watching the game played at the highest level. And I really appreciate how much um, work that is to you know, that that person is put in to get to that level of his game, whether it's a Tiger Woods or a Sean McKeel at the PGA. Um, you know, great success stories. Uh, ben Curtis come out, comes out of nowhere and wins the British Open. You know, guys like that. It, those are really neat stories, um, and th they happen every week. Guys, guys are falling down into the hole, and guys are crawling out of that hole. So there, there's a lot of stories out there. And when you're so close to the game and playing it week in and week out, you know who is struggling, you know who's playing good, and you know when it's really neat when a guy just comes out of a hole and everybody's happy for him. And I just want to bury a guy now when I'm on a golf course. I mean, if, I have a, if I'm playing good, I want to beat him so bad. I wish I knew what I knew now when I started. I probably wouldn't have had as many down times and a lot of doubt. I guarantee I would have had a lot more fun going through the process, but uh, um, it, it's, it's neat to be where I am now, and, uh, and I really look forward to, to learning and continuing, continuing to, uh, to learn the mental aspect of the game a little stronger that allows you to get to this level and allows you to do what a Tiger Woods does. I mean, he just wants, you to, he just wants to kill you when he's on the golf course uh, with the golf club, I mean, with, with score, and, uh, and he likes showing off, and, and I, I like uh, working to a I like putting in the work where I can show off my game on the golf course, and when that happens, it's really fun. And I think that's where that zone is, that, that intangible thing out there also called the zone. When you're in it, you know you're in it. Uh, when you're not in it, you don't know how to get in it. Um, you gotta, you got to figure it out. Something, it's, you wish it was just a little switch and you could flip it. Say, okay, I'm ready to go. Not many people can do that. Tigers can do it a lot. Nicholas has done it his whole career. Um, it, it's it's amazing um, the guys that have that kind of control.
I won the Houston Open in 92, which was my first win, which came literally out of nowhere. Uh, I was at the point of sending my uh, resumes out to try to get a coaching job again or a club pro job because I was not having a good year. I was really struggling with my game, and I go to Houston and I win. I had met Sharon for five minutes that year. You know, I didn't see her again, talk to her until the 93 Houston Open. Then we, we started to talk a little more, and, and uh, we started dating, and, and we got married quick and had a kid quick, and I uh, got married in 94 and had uh, Taylor at 95, and uh, she's just been a huge um, partner in, in this whole process. Uh, it's been a, it's been a, wow. It, it was a, a tough road there in the beginning because you know she's trying to figure out um, being a mom, being a road mom, uh, being a tour wife, how she's going to fit in when she was really um, determined, high goal oriented herself. Uh, she was a tennis pro, a golf pro. Uh, she had her own goals and she had to put those aside and she decided she was going to be uh, the total support system for me and my family and we decided to you know, at, at an early time that when the kids got to school age, well, when Taylor got to school age, um, we were going to homeschool and stay on the road and keep us as a family unit. You make a lot of sacrifices. You do what's important for your family. I don't think you can travel 36 weeks a year and have a husband gone from their family and have a successful unit as a family. I don't think you can be together and they can see their father as much. Just keeping the family together as one solid team, it's, it's really hard. But I think the best thing is, is when you do become that team and you can see the difference in life. I just think it's important. It works for us, and I don't think it would work for everybody, but you have to make it work. We're going on a bike ride, let's go. All right. I had to start listening to somebody that was telling me what to do to get better. And you know, I was stubborn in the beginning, and, and now I'm more open to it. And we've grown as a family, and, and uh, it, that's, I have such a solid base at home that it's made everything else a lot easier. Um, I just, you, you, she's a one of a kind. You can't find a, you, you can't find another wife like Sharon. He's grown so much in the last year that I don't think he's peaked. I encourage him to go play golf with the young guys because I think Fred's still good enough, or I know he's good enough. And most people will question why he's doing it, but in my heart, I know exactly why. And I think he's finally realizing who he is as a person and believes in himself. And that's not just in golf, but in life, and as a father, as a husband, as a golfer, as a friend. It was a brutal day. I had to come. We had terrible weather all week. And we had to finish, I had to finish 32 holes on Monday. Everybody had to finish their third rounds and there was a lot of golf to be played. And the wind was blowing 30 to 40 miles an hour out here. And it's a hard golf course on a calm day. And then when you have that kind of wind, it's a brutal golf course. So you had to be mentally tough that day. You, you couldn't give in to the conditions. And you knew when you teed off that morning on the range, everybody's just going, oh man, you know, this is gonna be a really tough day. Well, those guys are beat before they even go out there and tee it up and, and restart their round. So, you know, I looked at that saying, okay, you keep a good attitude, let's have fun with this thing. I know it's gonna be hard, but, you know, let's have fun. Have a walk up for Funk. I was here, but the funny part of that story was it was Monday morning and I did not come out at the beginning. I, we had just gotten our house, we had a house full, so I was sweeping and vacuuming and I was kind of nervous, not because he was in contention, but just because the whole week it's a very high pressure week. So I'm watching him on the internet, play by play and um, shot link. And all of a sudden the wind was blowing so hard it knocked our internet out. And I'm just like, my friend came over and said, let's go watch him. I, I really don't want to go out there. I just want to relax. I want to stay home. I want to clean my house. And she goes, no, be a good wife. Go out for three holes. Well, we never came back. We totally, we stayed. We caught him, I think, on the sixth hole of his last round and followed him in. I ended up finishing the third round shooting 71, which I was really proud of. I don't really recall what I did that third round, but the fourth round uh, restarted and I got to the seventh hole and I was about five behind and I had about a 30, 40 footer on, for birdie on the seventh hole and I told my caddy, I said, you know, I'm, 
I make a few birdies, I can get in this thing because everybody's coming backwards. And my caddy just kind of jokingly said, well, you better start. I mean, you, this is as good a time as any. I said, yeah, you're right. So uh, I made that putt, I made another long one on eight, and I made a, another birdie uh, on 12. And, and all of a sudden, I, and I birdied 13, and I have a three-shot lead, I think, going down 14. I didn't want to see the board, but I saw the board, and I had a, a three-shot lead. And then I proceeded to three-putt 14. I had a tough first putt, and then I three-putted 15. Two putts, 16, and, and now you're in the one of the best amphitheaters in all of golf. And uh, I knew I was, I was already in that zone. I was when I was making birdies, it was fun. It was I wasn't getting caught up in the moment. Biggest tournament I've ever, you know, that I would want to win. Um, I, strongest field at home on this tar, hard of golf course in those kind of conditions. So I was very conscious of what was happening, and then I had to wait. On this tee that we're talking on right now on the 17th tee, I had to wait about 10, 15 minutes to hit a shot and got it on dry land and I three putt that. So um, that was the big boo boo because the other three putts were, were from long range and tough putts. But uh, it was my tournament to win or lose and I'm handing it away. I hit the best drive I probably ever hit. I just striped it down the middle and I hit a six iron and I aimed at the pin or just left of the pin to let the wind carry it over and, and I kind of toe hooked it a little bit and uh, goes in that bunker and I make the putt and and I knew it wasn't to win the tournament I thought maybe it was to win the tournament but I knew it was not the defining winning moment but for me it was it was I did what I had to do I had to make that putt and uh, to, to give myself a chance and that's when I just total release of emotion when I slammed the hat down and, and uh, it was such a satisfying moment. I was a nervous wreck. I was up in the stands when he made the putt on 18, and I was just, nobody knew. I was just up there with about a 1,000 people in the middle of him, just watching him kind of hiding. And when he made it, I'm just, thank you, God. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing what he did. I didn't believe it. I mean, it took me a few days for, for it to really sink in. And it was such a defining moment of my career. It was the peak of anything I've ever achieved at that point and uh, it, it just was so satisfying because this is my new home when I moved here in 92 and and uh, such a big tournament it was just a great great feeling to know that I was always going to be a players champion and I was always going to be the winner of my home tournament. I was having a good year, um, but I ended up finishing 11th in points. And Jack called me and he says, well, you didn't do, you know, when he was picking the team, I was up at Firestone and sitting in a restaurant. And he says, well, you didn't do what I need you to do. I said, yeah, I know, Jack, you know, I didn't get enough points. He says, yeah, but I picked you. And I was so excited. I just yelled out in a restaurant, boy, Jack, yeah, you picked me. And uh, I was so looking back on that, so excited and so honored to be Nicholas's pick. I've, I think I I put it, I took the position that that was more of, more of an honor being 11th and being picked by Jack than finishing 10th and being an automatic pick. That was such an experience in South Africa. It was uh, beyond my um, anyone's expectations. It was such a fun time. And I wanted it so bad to make that team for the next President's Cup, which I did on my own merit, was the highlight of my career. Um, because now you're playing for team and country. You're not playing for yourself. It's not a, it's not a selfish thing. And the camaraderie, the togetherness, the, the competitiveness of the team, um, having Jack as the captain, and to get words of uh, wisdom from Jack. Um, it, it's, it was pretty neat. I remember Jack one morning, he just said to us, uh, you don't have to do as much as you think you got to do coming down the stretch in tournaments. Everybody else thinks you got to do more, and everybody thinks you got to do more than you have to do. You go out there and just play your game and keep setting up birdies. Uh, give yourself opportunities. You don't have to force the issue. Usually the guys will come back to you, and that's what Jack said happened to him in his career when he showed up on the leaderboard. Everybody panicked. They thought, oh, now we got to start making birdies. And they usually made it bogeys, and Jack just had to cruise in. And he said he, one day he three putted 18, thinking he had to do 
more than he had to do trying to make a birdie and he ran it by and th missed it coming back end up losing the tournament and he swore he'd never do that again and he says i'd have to look it in the record books that he that uh he never beat himself again on the final holes he let somebody might have beat him but he never beat himself so um that was that was pretty good insight coming from the man i mean he's it, it, it carries a lot of weight when you're sitting there in a room and and the greatest, new greatest of all time, you know, Tiger's in the room with him and Tiger's all ears. He's sitting there and just listening to Jack and trying to get any little tidbit that Jack's going to throw out. And, uh, you know, when a guy throws you a bone, you want to you wanna take advantage of it. After I won the Players' Championship, which was in, in March, I got a call in the middle of the, that summer of 05, and they said, Fred, you want to play in the skins? And I go, the skins? I says, what skins? I says, the skins, you know, the one over Thanksgiving. I said, how the heck did I get in that? They said, from winning the players. Oh, yeah, well, who's in it? And I was kind of debating, because I know it's such a spotlight event, showcase event, there's only four people. I didn't know I could handle that kind of exposure and, and the pressure that came with it. So they said, well, we're hoping Freddie Couples and Tiger Woods and Annika, and I went, yeah, all right. Yeah, actually, I forgot the one story. We're at the President's Cup, and we're at our first team dinner at night, and we're all at this long table, and Tiger's sitting across from me. I go, hey, Tiger, you know I'm in the skins? He goes, yeah. He starts laughing. I go, what are you laughing at? He goes, you know Annika's going to outdrive you. And I go, I said, I didn't need to hear that. Jack, I look at Jack, and Jack's just shaking his head, and he's laughing. He's going, yeah, you're in trouble. And I go, Jack, Jesus. So Furyk's down at the other end, and he goes, yeah, you know, I never watched that, but I'm watching it this year. I guarantee she's going to outdrive you. And I'm going, golly, now I can't even, I can't even eat. I'm, I'm so upset. I'm like, I'm going to get outdriven. I'm going to be an embarrassment of the, of the tour. And, and this is all for mankind here. I got to, I got to stay. You know, I got to keep it by her. But it, it just built up to this. Anxiety level was so high. I was so. That was the most nervous. I've ever been, any time in my career as the first tee of the skins match. Shot there. Shot. Thanks. I got, gotten to know Annika a little bit, and we were doing a skills competition, and I had thought of um, getting a skirt. I wanted to ask Annika first. So I asked her during breakfast. I said, Annika, you know, I, we're in the skins here, and I was thinking of getting a skirt, and, and if you outdrive me, I'll put the skirt on. And, she, and I want to make sure it's okay with you, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make it an awkward moment for you. She said, oh, no, that'd be great. That'd be great. So. We get there to, to the Palm Springs, and my wife goes out and buys two of these skirts. And the one I had on was this huge thing, and this other one. And I go down to Tiger's room, I model it for him. And uh, he thought it was hilarious. He's like, man, he just thinks there's something seriously wrong with me, and, and that's okay. But he was having a kick with it, and, and so I'm thinking, okay, this is the skirt I'm gonna wear, Tiger. And said, so now, if I have to put it on, while I'm lining up a putt, you know, we gotta say something, you know, some golf term. and. Uh, he says, yeah, we'll come up with something. So kind of let it go. So we're getting ready for the air the next day, and we're all getting mic'd up. And I give Annika this, the skirt in her bag. And first hole, I hit a good drive, and she's only a yard behind me. And I'm going, oh, boy, here we go. So I, I thought she's probably going to get me somewhere. So sure enough, on the third hole, uh, dog leg right, and there's a hill there. And I hit a good drive, but it hit right in the hill and just stopped. And to the left, it's flatter. And if Annika hit, hit her little power draw out there and got the roll out um, it, it would go by me and so I hit my drive and I walk over and Tiger says she's got you I go what do you mean she hadn't even hit yet she says oh no no she's got you here she's gonna hit the left of that hill it's gonna roll right by you I go all right all right so sure enough right when she makes contact the ball hadn't even come off the face Tiger goes she's got you she's got you so we get out there and it was close it was close but we gave it to her and I put the skirt on and it turned out to be a really good TV moment. It lo loosened everybody up. Uh, TV had a good time with it. And uh, we finally get up to the green, and I kind of forgot about the lining up the putt thing. And so I bend down, and Tiger's on the other side, and he's behind the hole. And what do you think, Tiger? <laughs> Honestly, I think it might be a ball. No, make that two balls out. <laughs> <laughs> it just came across so funny. I was breaking up. I look up. Annika's about 40 yards away down at the front of the green, and she's just shaking her head, and, and Freddie's just shaking his head, and the TV had a great time with it. And uh, the, the irony of the whole thing was that I finally had won a tournament 
of great stature of the Players' Championship, and I'm known now, everybody says, congratulations for the Players' Championship, way to go, you know, you're unbelievable, way to go. And then all, where's the skirt? That's all you hear now, where's the skirt? Hey, I got a skirt for you. And uh, so I'm known more now for the skirt and putting that on on the TV than, uh, than anything I've done on a golf course, but that's fine, it was fun, and, and I've kind of have fun making fun of myself my whole career, I've done that, and, and, uh, and, and I enjoyed the lighter moments on tour, and that was one of the best ones on tour that I can remember. JT is a uh, local kid here in Jacksonville that was uh, paralyzed from a football tackle. He made a tackle and uh, snapped his neck. And you know, it was one of those deals where you hear about it in the paper. I didn't know him before, but it was just one of those, you know, another another kid, high school kid, college kid, pro athlete gets paralyzed from some mishap, and uh, he, he just never really hits home, or very seldom does it hit home. Well, I decided to go. Uh, visit JT at his house, and it, was, it happened to be his aunt's house because uh, his parents' house were not adequate enough for uh, wheelchair access and everything. This kid sitting in a wheelchair, great looking kid, uh, just so handsome, uh, great attitude. I was in there for about 40 minutes, and I just said, I got to do something for this kid. I had no idea what. I just had no idea what I could do, what position I could put myself in to help this kid. But I just felt like there's something was going to come across. Um, God was going to send something to me, allow me to help this kid. And uh, I got in the skins. So I win the players, get in the skins. 20% uh, of the money you win at the skins goes to somebody, anybody you want, some charity or anything. So I dedicated it to JT. I end up winning the skins. I get 185000 goes to JT. All, immediately we have a a pretty good trust. They had a trust set up already, but it wasn't that funded. They had about 100, 150,000 in it. Well, our goal was to build him a house and get his family under one roof. And it'd be totally wheelchair accessible. He'll have freedom to do what he wants to do. And um, we did it. We had a golf tournament, raised more money. We had some charity things. We ended up raising a tremendous amount of money for JT, uh, which he's going to need. Uh, Sharon went on a mission to get the house donated as much as we could. Uh, the PGA Tour kicked in the lot. Um, so we, we, we had a lot for them. We had the site, the location. We had um, Cordell Builders, a uh, local builder here, um, volunteered their services to build a house. Every single person that we asked donated. So I mean, it was Jeldron, it was um, Kohler, it was 84 Lumber, it was every Mulligan floor, everybody said yes. And they came to, help JT and the greatest thing now is the family can kiss their daughters goodnight. They can, um, JT can go outside on his own. The family wasn't allowed to go to the house for three weeks prior to, we said you can't even drive by and see the outside. So now it's all landscaped, it's done and they pull in the driveway and, and it's just really an emotional day and when they- All the oh, furniture. Yeah and all, the, yeah it was completely decorated with furniture. Furniture just, was donated. Just, just, Perfect. You're just ready to turn the key, you start living in the house. That's you. It's overwhelming. We can't wait. I can't sleep last night just thinking about it. And having it late this morning. I can't eat I can't eat this morning. Just just waiting. I'm just happy and excited to see it. This is awesome. <laughs> to see the joy and the two girls come out of their shells and just to be happy again, and that to me is the most amazing the thing. The biggest thing he looked forward to was a hot shower. He hadn't had one in two years. That was the first thing he did when he got in that house. Falls up there. Fred and Sharon, they, they mean the world to us. We love them so much. When we first saw them, they saw the vision of the new house and just to see it finished. Now we thank God for them. And, uh, we thank God for this beautiful house. Absolutely. JT. When they walked in, the emotions were as high as they could get. Uh, it was a great day.